I want you to get out your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 1. But while you're turning there, I want to read a scripture to you out of the book of Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18. In Proverbs 18, and there's a reason why I'm going to read this verse, and you'll understand it in just a minute. In Proverbs 18, verse 13, the, the Scripture says in the New Living Translation, and this is not in my notes, so it's not going to be on the screen. Spouting off be, before listening to facts is both shameful and foolish. Spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. That, that's the way the New Living Translation says it. In the English Standard Version, the way it says it is this. If one gives an answer before he hears, come on now, it is his folly and his shame. The reason why I open with that passage of Scripture today but before we get into the reading of the text of Genesis chapter 1, is that I'm going to be teaching some things today that some of you have never heard. I'm going to be diving into some areas that some of you may have one conception or one understanding of the text. And my goal today is not to bring confusion, but my goal today is rather to bring insight and, and also to bring questions. Because there's been a lot of things that have been taught historically whether it be within the Pentecostal vein of, of Christianity or within the Baptist vein or the Catholic vein or whatever vein that you might have been raised in or around, and some of it has been taught because it's been echoed from generation to generation, but it's not biblically sound. So here, Pastor, today, my goal today is not to attack your doctrine. My goal today is rather to get all of us to ask some questions based off of what the Bible says. Because here's the deal, if the Bible says it, then we must believe what the Bible says. Amen. If the Scripture bears it out, then we are not afforded the right to argue philosophically if the Scripture is clear on what it says. Amen. And so today we're going to be diving into our supernatural series, and it's going to be very interesting. Today, it's my desire to endeavor through this new series into some very deep and yet extremely important topics regarding the, the supernatural. In this present hour, there seems to be this extreme infatuation with the supernatural in every facet. And it can be found in movies, sitcoms, magazines, books, in our educational systems, and on our college campuses, and even as far as going all the way down to the Disney Channel. The supernatural is everywhere. But in light of all of this, how does the Christian go about finding what is truly truth? And what is solid biblical doctrine regarding the supernatural? The supernatural is everywhere, and it is especially found within the pages of our Bible. Listen to me today. Everything in your Bible is supernatural. Everything. Say it, say it with me. Everything in my Bible is supernatural. The supernatural is everywhere, from the creation story to the history of a nation through its victories and vices, all the way down to the story of the Messiah and his subsequent redemption offered to mankind through the cross. The Bible is supernatural. It is the absolute authoritative guidebook to the supernatural. But before we, we progress forward into our time of study, I want to be abundantly clear with one point. You do not have to study darkness to learn and know how powerful the light is. You do not have to avail yourself to matters of influence outside of the Christian faith. I want to warn every single one of you to be very careful with how and what you study because what you let influence you will eventually control you, period. This is the reason why the Lord was so staunch 
on the principle, both in the Old and New Testament, that we must guard our lives against the influences of darkness. You do not have to peer into the darkness to see how powerful the light is. All you got to do is flip a switch and turn the light on in the room, and a light bulb can, can give you revelation of how powerful light is against darkness. It expels it. Now, with all of that said, it is my goal to discuss four specific topics in this series, which will give us a fundamental foundation on which to stand doctrinally as well as practically. Today, I'm going to talk about four specific things. I'm going to discuss the, the fall of creation, the fall of man, the pre-Adamic existence, and the fall of Lucifer. This is important because all four of these are tethered together and provide us context for the following sermons that will be taught on the forthcoming Sundays. And it is the biblical text that lends us insight into the fall, both of creation and man, but it also gives us insight to an existence that existed before Adam and Eve. Now, some of y'all are going to try to, are going to choke on that, but again, do not form an opinion until I have given you the facts that your Bible bears out. Is, give me that for the next 45 minutes. Next Sunday, and we're going to discuss that in just a little while. Next Sunday, I'm going to discuss the Genesis 6 conspiracy. So I would encourage you, I'm going to give you some homework. Starting tomorrow to next Sunday, your challenge is this. Pick up your Bible and read from Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 to the end of Genesis chapter 10. Now the following Sunday after that, I'm going to discuss about fallen angels and demons. What is their origin and what is their function? Because fallen angels and demons are not the same thing. Again, that has been taught, but that is not biblical. Demons and fallen angels are not the same thing. I'm, we're gonna, I'm, and I'm going to use the Bible to prove that to you. Furthermore, we're going to be discussing a little bit about witchcraft because that is the Sunday before Halloween. Now, I've had people ask me that as their pastor, what are my views on Halloween? Well, here's the deal. I do not participate with Halloween because it is pagan in its origin. Don't clap, because some of you, I was raised Catholic. Halloween was a holiday just as big as Easter and Thanksgiving, okay? So again, I'm not here to attack, and I'm not here to hurt. I'm just simply here to say, this is what the Bible says, let us reason together, because that's what the Scripture says. Again, we have to be very careful with what is culturally normal because we are surrounded by fossilized pagan customs that are accepted within Christianity. And I talked about that just a few weeks ago. Whenever the, whenever the Catholic Church in the 4th and 5th century, because they were absorbing culture for, for the sake of growing the church, they become tolerant and accepting of things that were anti-Bible. It's called inclusivism. That's what the church is having to navigate now. See, there's nothing new under the sun. History repeats itself because we're too ignorant to know enough about our future, or our past rather, to keep it from happening again. And my goal is to address some of these things. And so, and then on that, on this Sunday before Halloween, which is the last Sunday of the month, I'm going to be addressing about angels and demons and witchcraft. And then on Halloween Sunday, on, uh, on October 31st, we're going to magnify Jesus above the God of this world. But I'm going to, I'm going to narrow down and I'm going to focus on and I'm, I'm going to teach some things here. And listen to me, every Sunday is important to the next Sunday. So, so do not listen today and then miss two Sundays and try to jump in at the end because by the time we get to the last Sunday, it's not going to make any sense to you. This is like Tetris. It's all got to fit together and then everything wins, right? So I'm building a house. I want y'all to build it with me. And on that Sunday, I'm going to be dealing with two very important passages of Scripture that Jesus gives us insight to about the last days. Jesus said this, as it were in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And as it were in the days of Lot, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Those are not dualities of, pro of, of prophecy, because what was happening during the days of Lot and what was happening during the days of Noah were two different things. They have been taught 
to be unilaterally the same. They are not unilaterally the same because Peter and Jude in the New Testament fight against them being the same. Again, we have to go back to to study what the first, second, and third century, what the early church fathers were teaching to the church. Because by the time you get to the fourth and fifth century, you have influences of pagan culture beginning to take root within modern Christendom. And for the last 1,600 years, orthodox view of Scripture and people who actually built their faith off of the Word have been shunned because what the Bible says and what modern Christianity teaches are antithetical to one another. Now, uh, people, uh, well, you're just trying to be conflicting for the sake of being conflicting. No, 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 no. I'm trying to get us back to the Word. If the Bible says that God honors His Word above His name, then who are you to try to twist His Word? Because in twisting His Word, are you not defaming His name? Again, I'm just offering some questions for, for the sake of conjecture, for us to think. And not just, well, the preacher said it, so it must be true. No, is it in the Word? So my goal behind this series is this. I wanted to seek out some answers to some very complicated questions that I have had about the Bible. Well, pastor, you went to Bible college and you've been in ministry for all this time and you still have questions about the Bible? Yep. Yep. I do. And it's from those questions that was the genesis of this. And some of these questions, I feel very confident that many of you, if you've spent any time studying, especially in the Old Testament, that some of these questions are going to jump off the page of you and go, wait a second, why did that happen that way? What was the the premise of that? Now, my, my goal in that is to push all of you to study your word. I have found in my personal time of study and preparation for this message that with every answer I have found, and listen to me, with every answer that you find in the Scripture, it always leads to more questions. Leonard Ravenhill said it best. He says, there is no finality to the Christian faith on this side of eternity. Just as soon as you think that you got God figured out, he turns just a little bit and you learn something completely different about him than what you thought you you knew. And now what you thought you knew, now you don't know if you know it anymore. I could sit down and preach right there for just a little while. So I want you to stand with with me this morning. We're going to honor the Lord in the reading of his word. We're going to begin in Genesis chapter 1. We're going to read two passages of verses. And if you've got a pen and a notebook, I pray that you do. If you do not and you've got a pen, I want you to make some notes in your Bible. Excuse me, everybody there. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, they'll have the verses on the screen as well. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. Sentence stop. Grammatical structure of, of sentences in your Bible are extremely important whenever it comes to proper interpretation. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Let's pray. Father, I pray that over the next few minutes that you would bless our time of study. I pray that you would add your blessing to the reading and the hearing of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You you may be seated. In Genesis chapter 1... We are introduced to the genesis of Genesis. This chapter and verses de- de- denote, rather, the beginning of the creation story, but all is not what it seems to be in this passage of text. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, we are introduced to, to the original creation story. And do we have the graphic to put up on the screen with the timeline? If, if, if we're able to throw that up, uh, if, when it pops up, let me know. I'm going to keep teaching. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, there it is, we are introduced... To the original creation of the earth. Now notice this first bubble here. The the creation of the earth. You have the original earth. You have the chaotic earth. And you have the restored earth. So there are three transitions of time. That are noted in two verses. Now how can I prove that biblically? Hang out with me. We are introduced to the original earth. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 1 records the the creation of the original earth and heavens. But notice the pluralization of heavens. 
But something happens between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. Or excuse me, verse 1 and verse 2. And I'm going to show you why I've made that statement with the Scripture themselves. Anybody interested yet? In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, we are introduced to the chaotic earth. Verse 2, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. In verse 2, it records a chaotic earth that was without form and void. Now, I want us to take a few minutes to do a word study here, and I'm going to walk you through some Hebrew. Now, people say, well, how do you study that? Biblehub.com. Bible, I'm, 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 I'm not going to run all over the place today. I'm going to be slowing down in teaching because these things are very important. Again, we, we are building a house. I'm laying the foundation today. Biblehub.com has an incredible strong concordance that allows you to break down every word in the sentence structure of every verse in your Bible. So I use that a lot. So whenever you hear me say, well, the Hebrew word is this, it's Biblehub.com that I've got that from. Okay, and that is, a, that is a credible source. Now, there are three words that I want us to focus on. Was without form and void. Say it with me. The earth was without form and void. Hang out with me. The word in Hebrew for was in the Strong's Concordance is the number 1961. It is the Hebrew word hayah, H-A-Y-A-H. It, it is pronounced hayah, H-A-W-Y-A-W. Hayah does not mean was. Are you, are you ready to go deep? Take the blinders off and let the word interpret the word. The word hayah in Hebrew does, does not interpret to mean was. It literally interprets to mean to fall out, to come to pass, or to become. Hence, the grammatical structure of this sentence reads, the earth became formless and void. Or it came to pass that the earth was formless and void. That word there is became. It is not was. And that one word change in the entire landscape of that sentence changes our entire view of the original creation story of the earth being formless and void. It was not created formless and void. It became that way. But let's look at the next word. We don't want to get bogged down there yet. The word in Hebrew for, for without form or formless is the Strong's Concordance number 8414 in Hebrew, which is the Hebrew word tahu, tahu, T-O-H-U, which interprets to mean formless, confusion, and we know who the author of, of confusion is according to the Scripture. It means formless, confusion, unreality, or emptiness. The NASB translation notes it to mean chaos, desolation, emptiness, a waste place. Now, we know according to 1 Corinthians 14 and 33 that God is not the author of confusion. Thus, it lends itself for us to understand that God's original creation of the earth had been impacted by, by something or some event that had taken place that caused the earth to become a waste place and void, uninhabitable, broken, a place of confusion. Therefore, it seems to reason that something must have taken place between Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. Now, I know some of this is new to you and you're going, wait a second, Pastor, that's just a little too far. Hang out with me. I'm not done yet. Because if we let Scripture interpret Scripture, everything I just said is true. I'm going to prove it to you. Now, the word here in Hebrew for void is, is the Strong's Concordance number 922, which is the word wabahu, which, which interprets to mean emptiness or a void place. The bottom line is that God never creates anything incomplete or broken in its genesis. Therefore, it would seem to reason that something has happened between Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. Is anybody interested in, in, in any of this? All right. Case in point, verse 1, notice now, mentions God creating the, the heavens and the earth. Am I in the word? In the beginning, God created the heavens, plural, and the earth. But verse 2 only mentions the earth being formless and void. How is it that both of them were unilaterally created at the exact same time, and one is in order and the other is in disorder? 
One is functional and one has no purpose. One is in its place and the other one has no function. It is riven with, with chaos. It is broken and it is uninhabitable. Moving forward, then, then we read in Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, and also in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3, which introduced the restoration of the earth. So you have the original earth, you have the chaotic earth, and then you have the restored earth, which is the creation story that we know from Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis 1, 3, and 5, then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was, was good, and God spared, uh, excuse me, separated the light from the darkness, and he called the light day and the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning and that was the first day Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3 so God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because it is because because on it rather God rested from all of his work that he had done in creation thus the restored earth has been celebrated or rather was celebrated with a Sabbath the restored earth was accomplished in a literal seven days listen to me seven 24-hour periods the, the, this whole farce of, well, the, the creation story was, was 700 years per day or 1,000 years per day. That is not what the scripture bears out because it ends every day with, and it was evening and morning, and that was the first day. It was evening and morning, and that was the second day. It was seven literal 24-hour periods. However, but the question must be asked, what happened to the original earth that required God to restore it. We're going to talk about that in just a little while. Now, moving forward, in light of the fall of creation, noted in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2, and its subsequent recreation leading up to the creation of Adam and Eve, we know according to the biblical narrative that Adam and Eve fell into sin by eating from the tree in Genesis chapter 3, right? We all know that story. Now, the warning of God to Adam was that in the day that they would eat of the tree, that they would die. Now, we obviously know that that had to have been a spiritual death because whenever they ate of the tree, they didn't kill over and die because they went on to have babies and so forth. So, and it is from this fall that humanity's moral fiber and standard of living begins to spiral out of control, which leads all the way down to the flood of Noah and then the subsequent destruction of both humanity and Nephilim. Genesis chapter 6, we're going to talk about that next, next, next week. Whenever the sons of God, the angels of God, fallen from heaven, came and procreated with the daughters of men, and the giants were created into the earth. That's why Noah's flood happened. Well, it was because of sin, preacher. Well, if it was because of sin, then every one of us need, need to start taking stock in life jackets. Come on. It had to have been more than that. And I'm, I'm on, we're, going, we're going to talk about that next Sunday. I don't need to get bogged down there. But what about this pre-Adamic existence that I made reference to earlier? Now, people want to say, well, the pre-Adamic existence is a theory. It's not biblically provable, nor is it biblically validated. Wrong. It is biblically proven, and it is biblically validated, and I'm about to prove it to you. Are we good? Everybody take a big breath. Now let it go. It's going to be all right, because we're about to go, go deeper. Now, how can I prove that this, that this statement is, is biblically accurate? It is at this point regarding the, the creation of Adam and Eve that I want to focus on a particularly interesting passage of Scripture found in Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. Now, I'm going to quote from the King James Version, and, there, and there's a reason for doing that, and the premise is for me to clarify my point. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27 and 28, this is what the scripture says. So God created man in his own image and in his likeness of God, or excuse me, in the image of God cre created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and every living thing that, that moves upon the earth. The Hebrew word used here in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27 for replenish is the Hebrew word malah, the Strong's Hebrew concordance number 4390, which, which means to be full or to fill up. Now, what is all the more interesting about this Hebrew word is that it is the exact same word phrase used in Genesis chapter 9 verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, notice, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. God gives the exact same instruction to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1 that he gives to Noah and his sons in Genesis chapter 9. And he uses the word replenish. It's the exact same word. 
Now, we obviously have context of understanding the replenishment based upon the, the flood of Noah and the subsequent destruction of humanity, as well as the Nephilim in, uh, noted in Genesis chapter 6. However, this matter we're going to discuss next Sunday. Moving forward, though, if God told Noah to replenish the earth after the flood, then why did he tell Adam and Eve the exact same thing to replenish the earth if nothing had existed before them? In Genesis 1, he says, And God created man in his image and in his likeness, and he gave him dominion over the fish, the sea, the fowl, the air, the beast, the land, and every creeping that creeps upon the earth. And he created man and woman, and he created them, and, he t- and then he tells them, be, be fruitful, tend to what I've given you, multiply, procreate, and replenish. Well, wait a second. He told Noah and his three sons the exact same thing. Now, we have context of the replenishment factor for Noah and his three sons because the flood had just killed everybody. But he uses, guys, it's the exact Hebrew phrase. And it's only noted that way twice in the entire Bible. So if the Scripture says that God is commanding Adam and Eve to replenish the earth, then could something or would it be correct and proper to say that if he's commanding them to replenish, that they're not the first creation in the earth. Take a breath. This is not heresy. This is Bible. And all I'm doing is posing some questions. But we're about to go a little bit deeper here. According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the word replenish, as defined as, is to mean to fill or to build up again, to fill with persons or animals. So if God is telling Adam to replenish, then what happened before Adam? Why did God tell Adam to to replenish the earth if there had not been an existence in the earth of beings in the earth that preceded Adam and Eve? Why did the earth become chaotic and without form and void? I believe some of the answers to that are found in Ezekiel chapter 28. I want you to turn there with me, and I'm going to... Jesus. All of my notes are in the app. So I encourage you, all my notes are right here. And you can get them in the church app and on our website. Go get my notes and study this out for yourself. Again, all I'm doing is using Scripture and asking questions. I'm challenging our thought process because because many of us have been taught things that are not biblical. And we can't validate it scripturally. And if the Word doesn't affirm it, then the Scripture says that let the Word be true and every man be a lie. Now... I want you to turn there to Ezekiel chapter 28. <clears throat> Whenever you get there, say amen. amen. Genesis 28, verses 11 through 19. Now, we've talked about the fall of creation. So something happened. The earth became void. We've talked about the, the fall of man, but the subsequent command of God of Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, and God told Noah and his three sons, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. It's the exact same sentence structure. Now, how many of y'all have been taught that Lucifer was the worship leader in heaven? Come on. Okay. How many of y'all have been taught that Lucifer was cast out of heaven? Okay. How many of y'all have, have ever been taught that Lucifer was never in heaven? Let's, I'm going to do a little reading. Anybody challenged yet? Some of y'all are like, Lord Jesus, this man sharing some stuff I ain't never heard before. Again, word. Ezekiel 28, verses 11 through 19. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me. Now, this is the prophet Ezekiel. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord. You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in the Garden of Eden, the very Garden of God. Pause. There is no way that Ezekiel is talking to an earthly king in Tyre because they are over 3,000 years removed from the Genesis chapter 1 record. 
So the king of Tyre or the prince of Tyre, Ezekiel is prophesying against an earthly kingdom and God gives him supernatural revelation about something that happened before anything else existed. Now, now hang out with me. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now pause. Whenever we are introduced to Lucifer in Genesis chapter 3, he's already fallen, embodying a serpent and trying to convince Eve to eat from a tree. So we, whenever we are introduced to the biblical narrative of Lucifer in Genesis chapter 3, he's already fallen. Ezekiel 28 talks about a pre-fallen Lucifer being in the garden of Eden. Let, let, let's just keep reading here. Whenever we are introduced to Lucifer in the garden, he is conversing with Eve and he is fallen. But whenever we are introduced here in this text, Lucifer is in a post-fallen state. But in this passage, he is in a pre-fallen state. He was in the garden of God. He was in the very garden of Eden. And the scripture says that he was the signet of perfection. That he was perfect. That he was squared away. That, and that, you notice now, he was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. But when we're introduced to Lucifer in Genesis 3, he's corrupted. Notice this. Every precious stone what was your covering, sardis and topaz and diamond and beryl and onyx and jasper and sapphire and emerald and carbuncle and being crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. Now, this is very important. L listen to me. Go and study. In Exodus 28 and in Exodus chapter 39, these nine stones that Ezekiel is talking about Lucifer bearing in his breastplate on the earth engraved in gold are nine of the 12 stones that the high priest wore on his breastplate whenever he went in to minister before the Lord on the day of Yom Kippur, on the day of atonement. Nine of the 12 stones Lucifer bore on himself which tells me that Lucifer was an authority. Keep reading with me. On that day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. Notice, he was anointed. Anointing is for the sake of authority. You were anointed with authority. Behold, I give you authority. I give you the Holy Ghost to have authority. I anoint you to have authority. This angel had authority. Furthermore, what does it say? You were the guardian cherub. If you are set guard over something, that means that you've got authority over what you're guarding to protect it from something. Wait a minute. What was he guarding? Does God need protection? Again, just posing questions. What was he guarding? He was guarding over the earth. He was guarding over the earth. I'm, I'm going to prove it to you. Notice this. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. The holy mountain of God is where the current temple mount is at. The temple mount was not in heaven. The temple mount is in the earth. In the midst of the stones of fire, you walked. Notice this. You were blameless in your ways from the day that you were created until unrighteousness was, was found in you. In the abundance of your trade. Now, slow down here with me. This word trade here in Hebrew is the Hebrew term rachula. You got to have a good sinus infection to say it right. <laughs> Hebrew Strong's number 7404, which means merchandise, traffic or trade now hang on a second you don't merchandise something for trade if there's no one else to trade it with but what is the the prophet says he says in the abundance of your trade if there's no one else in the earth and he was the authority in the earth if he was on the holy mountain of god in the earth and he corrupts himself in merchandising of the trade of what he has then what is he trading and with whom is the better question is he trading it with you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned so i cast you as a profane thing notice this it doesn't say from heaven does it he says, I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you. 
O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. Notice this, I will cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you, and by the multitude of your iniquities in, in the unrighteousness of your trade. Now that word there for, for trade is the exact same verse, or the exact same ver word, rather, used in verse 16. So you've got Lucifer. Ooh, Jesus. I might get in trouble here, but I'm, I'm just going to say it. You've got Lucifer doing exactly what a lot of corrupted people like to do. They try to use their gift for the sake of corruption and they merchandise their anointing. They merchandise their gift. Well, I can sing, but I'll only sing for you on Sundays if you pay me $1,000 a month to come and use my gift. Now, I'm not saying that people shouldn't be compensated, but at the same time, we have a culture to where everybody wants to prostitute the anointing and the call of God on their life for, for the sake of manipulation to serve a God of mammon. Now, the Scripture's clear that a labor is worth is higher. But at what point do we delineate a line be between us using our gifting and us living like Satan? You profaned your sanctuaries. Could this be a parallel to provide context to why Jesus got so mad at the money changers in the church? Because you've got Lucifer doing what? He is in the multitude of his iniquities and in the unrighteousness of your trade, in the merchandising of your gifting, in the exchange of what God has given you for what another existence can, can give you. You have profaned your sanctuaries. Could it be that this is the reason to why Jesus made his own whip and started flipping tables? It's because the exact same sin of Satan what was found in the sanctuary of God in Jerusalem whenever the people of God begin to use the law of God for the sake of padding their wallets. It was corrupt. They were using God's sanctuary for the sake of profit just as Lucifer did noted in this passage. So what does it say? God, God, the, the Lord through the prophet says, So I brought fire out from your midst. It consumed you and it turned you into ashes on the earth. Where? What does it say? Where? It doesn't say heaven. It says in the earth. In the sight of all who saw you. Wait a second. Who was there to see this happen if nothing existed at that time? Again, what does it say? In the sight of all who saw you. Who would have saw this if this fall happened be before Adam and Eve's creation? All who know you among the, the peoples, notice peoples, plural. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you, and you have come to a dreadful end and shall be no more. Again, I ask the, the question, what people were there that witnessed this and could have been appalled at it? Again, I'm not trying to create problems. All I'm trying to do is ask questions based off of what the Scripture says. Now, I want you to turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 14. It is my firm belief, based upon this, this passage, that it provides us some significant insight and a deeper understanding to what happened in the gap of time of Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Could it be that it was Lucifer's rise to power and his subsequent fall that caused the earth to become formless and void and darkness to fall upon the face of the deep? He fell at some time. Can we at least agree on that? He fell at some time. But where did he fall? That's the question. In Isaiah 14, is everybody there? Isaiah chapter 14, in, in beginning, in verse in beginning in verse 12, rather, excuse me. How you were fallen from heaven, O day star. Notice this now. The word for day star there in the Hebrew is ha'alel. 
Ha'alel, which is where we get the English term Lucifer from. Ha'alel interpreted literally means light bearer or shining one. Shining one. Now, with this in mind, could this be the reason why after all of this happened that God spoke, let there be light, and then in turn creates the sun and the moon and the stars on day three in the creation story because Lucifer was not just the authority of the earth. He was the emanator of the light and the glory of God in the earth, and he corrupted his gift in the, in, in the merchandising of his gift. He began to exchange the glory of God for the praise of other things and when he fell darkness fell upon the earth why would God establish an angel in the earth whose name literally means light bearer or shining one if the light coming off of him was not useful again just posing some questions here now whenever Lucifer falls all of this begins to fall apart And could this explain why darkness fell upon the face of the deep in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2? The thing or the being that illuminated the earth was extinguished because sin destroyed it. And this is the very reason why the enemy tries to get a a little bit of leaven into your life. Because he knows that if he can get a little bit of sin in you, that it will dim the anointing of God that is on you. He was the anointed cherub that covers. If there's any being that God has ever created that knows the power of the anointing of God, it is Lucifer himself. Why do you think that the enemy of your soul is roaming about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour? The premise of that is, is he's trying to stop the anointing on your life because he knows the power of of the anointing whenever it's on your life because he at one time walked in that same anointing. He was anointed by God as as a guardian cherub, as an authority over the earth. And because sin was found in him, the light of God was snuffed out. We got to be careful whenever we start allowing things into our life that are not of God because the enemy knows the value of destroying the anointing. The Bible said it is the anointing that breaks the yoke. The yoke of what? The yoke of his control over you. I feel my help coming now. I feel like preaching. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you have been cut down to the ground. You who laid the nations low. The, he who laid what low? The nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Lucifer was not established as an authority in heaven. Furthermore, if he was established as an authority in heaven, then why is he desiring to ascend to a place that he was already at if he was an authority in heaven? Why would you be trying to ascend to a place that you're already supposed to be at. He was not seeking to get into heaven while being in heaven. His goal was, notice, what does it say? You have been cut down to the ground. You who laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will ascend to the heavens. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. Notice this. I will ascend above the clouds. Paul's church family. Clouds, clouds exist because of atmospheric conditions. Which reiterates that Lucifer was not in heaven. He was in the earth. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. This is a future event. He is not attached to the far reaches of the pit yet. The devil is not bound in hell. The devil is not bound. Listen to me. The devil is not bound in hell. The devil is not bound into the bottomless pit until until the end of the tribulation period. And we ain't there yet. So the devil is not bound in hell. Jesus said that he was the power or the ruler of of this present age. And he's not a little kid in a pitchfork costume of the devil running around trick-or-cheating. 
The Bible says that he portrays himself, notice this, as an angel of what? Light. Why? Because it's his name. This is why Jesus said, when he was asked about the end times, he said, be careful that no man deceive you. Guys, the greatest uh, uh, trick of the enemy is deception. He is a master of it. The Bible says that he is the father of lies. That he tells lies and doesn't even realize he's telling lies because he's so convinced that what he's saying is truth that it makes him the progenitor of it. Moving forward. I will make myself like the most high, but you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Those who will see you will stare at you and ponder over you. Is this the man, notice this, that made the what? The earth to tremble. Is this the man who made the earth to tremble, who shook kingdoms? Notice, who made the world like a what? a desert and overthrew its cities and who did not let his prisoners go home. Notice now, it was Lucifer's actions that made this world or this landscape that Isaiah is prophesying about for the nations to fall apart, for the landscape to be turned into a desert, for everything to go upside down, and then for prisoners to be kept. Now the question has to be asked, there were cities in the earth Who built them? And lastly, if the scripture says that he has prisoners that he would not let go home, then who are they or what are they and where did they come from? Now, some of you are saying, Pastor, this sounds like (laughs) X-Files. You're just way off and I've never heard. If... Church family, if we're going to be a full gospel church, then we need to know the Bible in its fullness. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it is the glory of kings to seek it out. And if we are kings and priests unto our God, then there are things in the Word that God intends for us to know. If it's in there, He expects us to know why it's there and what the intent of it was. Notice this. It says here, All of the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb. But you are cast out away from your grave like like, like a loathed branch clothed with the slain. Those who are pierced by the sword, those who go down to the stones of the pit like a dead body trampled underfoot. Notice this, you will, be, you will not be joined with them in burial because you have destroyed your land and you have slain your people. Wait a second, whose land? The prophet is giving insight of the Lord speaking about Lucifer. And what does it say? You have de- destroyed your land. Whose land? Your land. You have slain whose people? Your people. Whose land and what people? Again, as I started with, I did not come to just give answers. I came to give answers that lead to more questions. And it's because of this insight that is provided both by Ezekiel and Isaiah that we understand that Lucifer was the anointed cherub that covered, that was set as an authority over the earth in the place of the mountain of God. And he said, in his heart being lifted up in pride because he was merchandising his gift for for the sake of commerce and trade with other beings or other something that he corrupts himself. And then he says, I'm going to ascend above the clouds. I'm going to ascend into the heavens. I'm going to make myself like the most high. And then he, he attempts to do that. And then all hell breaks loose in the earth and God's original creation of the earth is destroyed. The enemy releases hell in the earth to try to ascend into heaven. Now, when he falls, everybody heard the word Satan, right? Satan, we've heard that term. In Hebrew, it is not Satan, it is Hasatan. Satan means accuser. 
This is why the Bible says that, that he is the accuser of the brethren. He is the adversary of your soul. It means accuser or adversary. And it was Jesus himself that actually gave us insight into the event that subsequently led to that taking place. Satan was de deposed or rather ousted from his place of authority over the earth and was cast down. This makes sense why Lucifer went after the woman to get to the head. Notice Satan in Genesis 3 is not talking to Adam. He's talking to the woman. Hang out with me here. Whenever God created Adam, it says that he established Adam in the garden and gave Adam instruction to not eat of the tree. Whenever God creates Eve, Eve did not hear God's instruction. It was Eve that heard Adam's instruction about the tree. God told Adam, do not eat of that tree because the day that you eat of it, you'll die. Whenever Eve is questioned about it, what does she say? She said, I, I should not see it, touch it, or partake of it, lest it destroy. Notice she added to it. Deception. And the enemy took advantage of that. And destruction befell the earth. Now, Jesus gives us insight into this happening. Now, if Jesus said it, then it's got to be true, right? Everybody okay? Okay. Everybody being challenged right now with some stuff you probably ain't never heard before. Can I get an honest, just a hanky wave or something so I know I'm not by myself? Jesus gives us insight into this happening, which Ezekiel and Isaiah both prophesied about in several passages of Scripture. In the Gospel of St. John, chapter 12, verses 30 through 32, the Bible says, And Jesus answered, quote, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Notice this. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto myself. The gospel of St. John chapter 14 verses 30 through 31. Notice Jesus said here, I will no longer talk much with you. Notice this. For the ruler of what of this world is coming. The ruler of this world is coming. Again, the devil is not currently bound in hell. The devil is in a place of authority in the earth. He has no claim over me, but I do as the Father commanded me so that he, excuse me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise and let us go from here. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 10, verses 17 through 19. And the 72 re returned in jo uh, rejoicing, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, notice this, I saw Satan fall like lightning. What? From heaven. He's in the earth. He tries to ascend. Jesus gives credibility to what the prophets prophesied in Ezekiel 28 and in Isaiah 14 whenever Jesus said, I beheld Satan like a bolt of lightning being cast from heaven back to the earth. Behold, no, notice now, behold, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and upon scorpions and over all of the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Nothing shall by any means harm you. Come on, somebody. Now, that's some good promises right there from the Lord. If I can have uh, our uh, musician to come, please. Isn't it interesting that Jesus reveals this insight about Satan's fall like lightning to his disciples after they returned from rejoicing that they had power, notice this, over the demonic darkness around them. It's as if he's saying, hang out with me, I've seen him defeated before. And I'm going to see him defeated again. I've seen him struck down before. And I'm going to see him struck down again. Now what did the apostles have to say about this? The apostle Paul noted in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 2 and 3. In which you once walked following the course of this world. Following the prince of the power of the air. Satan. The, notice now, the spirit, singular, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, 
carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. The Apostle Paul notes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, the following, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled for those who are perishing. In their case, notice this, the little g, little g, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing what? The light. The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the very image of God. As I prepare to close our time together today, I know I've hit y'all like a tidal wave with a whole bunch of stuff. And as I talked about earlier, I encourage you, go and get my notes and study this. I've spent years of my life, and that is not exaggerating. I have spent years of my life studying the Genesis story and the fall of Lucifer because that gives us insight into what spiritual warfare is and what it is not. We get fruity and flaky and nutty whenever we move away from what the Scripture has to, to say about things. But I want to talk for just a second about this light of the gospel that the Apostle Paul talked about. Do you remember what I noted earlier about Lucifer's name? The word used for his name for day star in Isaiah 14 is Hallel, which literally means to be a light bearer or a shining one. Could Lucifer's name be the very reason why God spoke and said, let there be light? And then he created the sun and the moon and the stars later in the creation story because of the destruction of the earth that happened because of Lucifer's rebellion. Remember, in the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. It became without form and void. Why is it that the heavens and the earth were created at the same time, but by the time you get to verse 2, the heavens are still in order, but the earth is falling apart? Something had to have happened. Could it be that it was after this destruction that explains the darkness that fell upon the face of the deep? The illumination of the earth was extinguished because of sin, and sin de destroyed it. But church family, there was another illumination that was coming. And let me tell you the gospel story behind what I've taught you today. There was another illumination that was coming, and he would be the light of the world, the true light. I want to remind you of the words of Jesus in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 8 and verse 12, whenever, Je whenever the Scripture says, and again Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will notice what? Have the light of life. May I suggest that whenever Jesus spoke these words, that these words had historical impact that most of his audience missed and that the corruption around him could not extinguish the light that was in him. Whenever Jesus spoke that word, I am the light of the world, he was challenging the little G, the little God of this world to say, I'm not just here to fix what, what Adam messed up. I'm also here to take back everything that you sought to take authority over. And whenever Lucifer was in a fallen state, Jesus stands up and says, you, you might have heard about Ha'alel. You might have heard about a shining one that used to be an authority in the earth. But let me just tell you about the true light that has come. Let me tell you about the gospel light that will light the, the paths of darkness to bring sinners out of their sin and into his marvelous light. Let me remind you of the words of Jesus whenever Jesus said himself, he says, I am the light of the world. And whoever follows after me shall not walk in darkness for what? They shall have the light of life. May I suggest that whenever Jesus spoke these words, that it was a warning to the enemy that the true light had come and corruption was not going to extinguish it this time. He, Jesus, was the tried and true light of the world. And unlike Lucifer, corruption nor sin would ever be found in him. 
Because my Bible tells me that Jesus is the Lamb of God who had been slain before the very foundations of the world, before everything that was ever set into existence came into existence. Jesus had been the Lamb of God that predated all of that. And whenever God said, let there be light, it was God the Father using the spoken Word of God which would multiply thousands of years later, become flesh and dwell amongst us as the Lord Jesus, that God the Father used God the, the Son by the Word of God to speak illumination and light into a fractured world that had been destroyed by sin. If God can start over again and start over again and start over again, then don't you mark yourself off the list and say that God can't start over with you again. There's a light that comes with the power of the gospel that illuminates the darkened soul. There's a light that only Jesus can bring into your life that can light your way. Jesus is the light that is shining in this present darkness of sin. And if he can illuminate the universe, listen to me, Lord Jesus, if he can illuminate the universe with his word, then he can illuminate your soul with his word. If he can illuminate the darkness that spanned the eons of time, then don't tell me that he cannot illuminate your broken marriage. If he can speak light and not even need a sun, moon, or star to help him out, come on somebody, then he can do the same thing in you. He can speak the light of the word of God and illuminate you. We don't serve a dead God. We serve a risen Savior. According to the Scripture, He ever lives to make intercession for us. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, clothed in majesty. And one day, it is my hope and my prayer and my goal for every one of you under the sound of my voice, including everyone who's watching by TV and Internet and every other medium, to take as many of you with me that I might see you around that sea of glass around that golden throne to where the 24 elders stand and cast their golden crowns upon the ground and we shall worship the lamb that was slain before the very foundations of the world and depression and disease and brokenness and malady and emotional wounds and father wounds and mother wounds and brokenness and all of these things are going to be shattered when we stand around his glorious throne